stable jobs you can possibly get in medicine. Like there's just no unemployment ever. And I kind of like that just because, and that's just, again, that's personal. It's just left over from my parents being unemployed. Most of the time I was a kid, I always, always either about to get fired, fired or looking for new work. And I just, I didn't need that in my life when I was growing up. Um, they hadn't gone to college. So I imagine if I hadn't had that perspective, any college job would have probably given me the security I'm looking for, but I was looking for really secure. So just on a very practical end, I liked that better than some of the other things. And I really like people and I like helping people. So I wanted to be able to help people and use science. And I just felt like it was a really easy way to do that because you really do have to, I mean, medicine would be a miserable career if you didn't like helping people because it's kind of hard work. It's long hours. Uh, that it, you know, it pays okay and it's very secure, but compared to the amount of work you do, it probably doesn't pay any better or any more secure than a lot of other jobs that take that much training. So you have to actually like it to enjoy it. You have to actually like taking care of people. Um, Cause just as a pure job, uh, it's a lot of work. Um, it's a lot of uh, just sort of uh, slogging away at stuff which it's, it's not always glamorous and exciting. Um, but if you, if you know what you're doing is meaningful, you can do anything if you know it's meaningful, right? And I don't ever have a day of work where I don't know that what I'm doing is incredibly important and meaningful, which for me was huge to draw me into medicine. Now, the next aspect of that was, uh, what's it like? So emergency medicine is different based on where you work, but at Hennepin, uh, and it's actually, and I can actually give you what it's like and how it's changed in the last, I've been doing it now since I finished residency in 1999. So I'm 21 years out of residency of training. And, um, when I started, it was all, it was a lot more trauma. Minneapolis was a much more violent place in 1999 than it is today. So I would say 50% of what I did when I first started was, uh, personal violence. So gunshot wounds, stab victims, assaults, things like that. Now that's more like about 20%. Uh, so it's a lot less violence than there used to be. A lot more car accidents than there used to be. Uh, the other main difference is about half the people I work with are, physici are APPs, physicians assistants, um, which has made my job for me a lot more interesting uh, not because, because the, what the, essentially what I get to do now is I walk in, I figure out what's wrong, and then I hand it off to a PA who does all the treatments. And for me, I'm doing the part of the job I always liked the best. Uh, a lot of the PAs didn't like that uncertainty and they're happy in their job because these are my close colleagues. And I, so we talk about what we like about our job. They like the fact that they're not under any risk. They're not going to get sued because I've already kind of said, this is what's going on. And what all they have to do is sew up the cut or put in the central line or get the, you know, get the lab tests ordered, follow up on them, get the, they do a lot of the stuff that's a lot of the care uh, without the part of, of the risk of if you're wrong, you get sued and you have to figure out what's going on part. That's the part I like. In terms of how sick the people are, specifically uh, about 20% of the people I take care of are in shock or dying. So about one in five people. And I just know that because I know our billing records. So about a fifth, uh, about two fifths are really, really sick, sick enough so they need a huge workup and I have to order a lot of tests, but not actively unstable. Meaning um, I don't have to like actively resuscitate them or they'll die right away. Uh, and then about 40% have something that, I wouldn't go as far as to say routine because if somebody shows up in the ER, by definition, it's an emergency because at least in their mind, they don't know that it's not gonna kill them. About 40% of the people have something that is um, very stable. So the time pressure is just so they don't have to wait, not because if I don't make the diagnosis, they'll get worse. Um, and that's like sprained ankles, broken wrists, cuts, uh, back pain, a lot of that stuff. So the 20% that are sick, who are they? What's going on? Most of the time I'm busiest is because somebody's heart stopped. So that happens about two or three times a day at work. Someone, their heart stopped, we're doing CPR, we gotta get going again. Um, and then probably three to five times a day, 
someone can't breathe on their own. So they got to put a tube in to breathe for them. Um, and about that many also come in in shock. I mean, their blood pressure is not high enough to keep their brain perfused and they're unconscious. So we have to get them resuscitated and get their blood pressure back up. Uh, so those are the sickest patients. And that probably takes 80% of my time, even though it's 20% of the patients. Um, so most of the patients are pretty sick, more so now than 20 years ago, because I'm working with so many more PAs and they focus a lot of their careers on the more stable patients. So the uh, ankle sprains, broken bones, um, belly aches, things like that. And the person's not, they're stable enough to wait. Because then what the PA does is if they're having a hard time figuring out what's going on, they grab me and otherwise they take care of them. Uh, and that's about two thirds of the providers in our department are PAs now. We had like six PAs total when I started, so we didn't have very many. So that's actually a big thing that's changed. Um, and a really cool thing, because I think everybody's happier, because uh, you know, I like taking care of people who are, who are dying. And I like that, I like turning that around. So I like running in the room when somebody's about to die and making sure it doesn't happen and turning them around. Uh, a lot of people find that incredibly stressful and have no interest in doing that on a daily basis. Uh, and the, the fact that we can work together and we're both happier is awesome, right? So if I saw sprained ankles all day, I'd be kind of bummed because uh, I would never have really saved anyone's life. If not, I'm going to take care of a sprained ankle. Um, but if that's all I did, I'd, I personally would get bored. But for a lot of people, that's caring for people and it's intervening when somebody really needs your help, but in a less stressful situation. So it's, it's very complimentary. The, the PAs and the physicians together, we kind of help each other out. Or we, we're each doing the stuff that the other one doesn't really want to do. Uh, so it's made our job a lot better, actually. My job's a lot more fun even now than it was 20 years ago. What else did I miss? I think there's another question I missed. Uh, salaries. Um, salaries are a really good question. Emergency medicine pays really, really well for the number of hours you work. Uh, so how do I mean by that? Uh, on an hour to hour basis, it probably pays as much as any specialty. We're right in the middle for most specialties. So like interventional radiologists and neurosurgeons make the most money. Um, we make half of what they make. We probably make twice as much as what a lot of clinical based specialties make. Um, it's weird how the, it, it's, the reimbursement system is kind of weird, but essentially ER docs get paid more because our patients are dying. So we, you charge more when somebody's much, much sicker. Um, and you charge more when you do stuff at weird hours. So uh, the average ER doc around town probably works 12 to 15 days a month for eight hours, um, which is a really good amount of hours. It's a lot less than most physicians work. The downside is those hours are just as likely to fall on weekends, the middle of the night or evenings as they are during the day. So your hours are all over the place. You only work three or four days a week, but of those three or four days a week, probably one is on the weekend, two of them start after 3 p.m. And a couple times a night you work overnight for your whole career. I'm an academic, so we work a little bit less because I have research grants that cover half my time and stuff. Uh, but the hours are the best in medicine in terms of the number of hours worked, uh, but they're high impact hours, right? I mean, you. Most ER docs work about half of holidays. Uh, most ER docs work at least every third weekend, a lot every other. Um, on the other side of that though, uh, from a financial standpoint, you bill a lot better at nights and weekends. So I know a lot of ER docs who just work weekends because you can bill so much, you can essentially make a full-time salary only working you know, four or five weekend days a month, uh, which is kind of a nice deal. Um, so from that end, from like the pay end and the hours end, uh, it's a very good job. Um, it, it attracts a lot of people, uh, first, probably because it's exciting and you're like actually saving, like there's very few medical specialties. There's not, there's several, but emergency medicine is one of the one and you'd be like, today I saved somebody's life and be absolutely certain you did on an almost daily basis. You don't really get to do that as much. It, uh, you get it, theoretically do it and you get to plan it a lot. Um, the downside of that is probably you try to save somebody and they die anyway once a day too, which is the downside. Um, you work a lot of tough hours, uh, but the reimbursement for it's very good. Emergency medicine, nobody's complaining about uh, like what their pay is like in emergency medicine. Uh, the next question this year is about residency um, and balance for life. You know, 
It's a very good question. Residency is not that bad. Residency used to be much worse because there weren't any rules and they wanted to train you as fast as they could. Uh, now there's rules. You're not allowed to work more than like 24 straight hours, maybe 30 hours the longest, probably more than this, probably more like 30 hours straight, uh, which sounds pretty bad. But when you're taking care of people, uh, it's not like it's not like punching in and punching out. Like in residency, you're usually the reason that you're going so long is because you're new at your job. You don't know when you can't be at the bedside and when you can't leave. And you're taking care of a person that whole time. So you're spending 30 hours with a family that you're taking care of. So it doesn't, doesn't sound as bad as it sounds like if you worked a 30 hour shift, uh, you know, at, at a target or something. I mean, you know what I mean? It's not just working. It's, it's actually with people and doing stuff for people. So it's not as bad. So residencies aren't, they're a lot of work, but I will say when I was a resident, you know, I had friends that had gone to law school, so they're in their first law jobs. I had friends that had gone into business consulting and banking. Uh, early jobs are hard and they were all working as many hours as me. Their hours might've been more typically during the day, uh, but especially my friends who went into law school and were in their first few years as, in law firms, they worked the same number of hours I did, more than any worse. Um, there's more staying up for consecutive hours and that gets, the first time you work all night, that gets really hard, you get used to it. I can work all night now and I don't even, it's not even, you get used to it. I sleep it off later <laughs> and I've learned how to. And the more you do that, the easier it gets. That part's not that bad. Having a family and a, being a doctor, then one of the reasons I went into emergency medicine specifically is so I could be around and be, have a life outside of medicine. Uh, ER shifts are typically eight hours with paperwork and stuff, 10 at the most. So I'd never work more than 10 hours a day. And usually only, well, for, in a head up and it's only 12 days a month. Some of the private groups in town is 15 because they don't do any teaching. Uh, and then I'm around teaching a couple of days a week. But like when I was, uh, when we were younger, my kids are teenagers now, but when they were babies, my wife's a dentist, she was in dental school. I just worked uh, nights. So I would work 12 nights a month. And I had stayed home. We, our kids didn't need chakra. I stayed home with them during the day and napped when they napped and then went to bed and got a little sleep. And my wife got home from school and then went off to my shifts later. Um, so we were, you know, so I was actually did a lot of parenting. I still do a lot of parenting. I coach one of my kids' teams in two sports. I coach actually two different teams. Uh, so I can just adjust my schedule. So, uh, a lot of times when I, I coach soccer team, I coach soccer team. I just, uh, I work a lot of shifts to start at 5 a.m. So I get finished at one in the afternoon. So I plan time to coach in the afternoon. And um, during ski season when I coach, I, uh, I just, it's easy. I just uh, work a bunch of night shifts when I want to clear up schedules and I'm free all day. So it's very flexible. It's probably the, the most flexible. It's also very easy to dial back because I don't have a practice. So in a lot of specialties in medicine and one of the benefit, one of the beauties of medicine for a lot of people is that you have these patients you take care of, they're your patients, right? But they depend on you. So it's hard for you to stop working for a while. They need you to be there because you're their doctor. Uh, the, well, a downside and an upside of emergency medicine, I don't have any patients that are mine. If I see somebody too much, we talk to them about, you can't come to the ER that much. Uh, so if I was to cut to half time or to take a year off or cut to a quarter time or go back up to full time, it doesn't make any difference. Uh, it matters to my partners that I work with, but it doesn't matter to my patients. So I'm not letting anybody down. So it's actually very easy to flex into it. That's another reason a lot of people are trying to go into emergency medicine right now is because of that flexibility. It's got the big downside of a super high stress environment nights and weekends, but it's got a lot of flexibility, uh, which is one of the people that, that drags people into it. One of the challenges, I'm looking at the next question. One of the challenges about emergency medicine I didn't expect. Um, or wish I knew about. I will say I underappreciated. So when I was in college and medical school, I, any job I'd ever had before that had been nights and weekends, right? I mean, my job in undergrad, I was a bartender. Uh, and I continued to bartend for the first two years of medical school. So I'm like, I already work nights and weekends. What's the difference? And it didn't make any difference when I first started. Uh, when you're, when you're uh, you know, 15 years farther in my career, I've got teenagers in school and stuff, and it sucks when I work in the evening, right? They want me there to help with their homework. They want me to drive them to practices. They want me to go see their choir concerts, whatever it is. And I'm not there sometimes when I'm at work. So that is that is something I didn't really appreciate fully going into it. Uh, I didn't, that is, 
you get paid a premium for it and you do a lot of really cool stuff, but it's also the biggest downside of emergency medicine is that uh, I've worked half of the Christmases of my adult life, I've worked half the Thanksgivings. It's not the end of the world. And we've built traditions around it where we're at home and stuff, so it's fine. But uh, that's the part where it was worse than I thought. For the stress, strategies to handle the stress, um, that's a really good question. A lot of different ways to do it. Um, everyone I know in emergency medicine that's, has some sort of non-medical hobby they do. For me, I coach sports, I've already mentioned, but a lot of people do art, a lot of people do music. Whatever it is you do, you need something that's not related to the work that you enjoy. Because uh, it, it is hard to unwind after our shifts are there's no question their highest energy shifts. Um, never boring <laughs> ever, but uh, very, very stressful. And one of the really, another hard part about emergency medicine is you very, very quickly learn how to take charge of the situation. So I'm very used to walking in a room with 10 people panicking and one person dying and taking over the situation and making it all go okay. And you get very good at that. The problem is, if you use those skills outside of work, everyone hates you for it. So you get very good at becoming really good at getting your way and really good at taking charge of people and really good at getting people to do exactly what you told them to do when you want to. You get really bossy, professionally so, and so you can save people lives. And it makes you a great emergency physician, but all of us need to de-stress because one of the first things they tell you when you go into it and you learn very quickly is you can't use your work personality outside of work because uh, like your partner won't tolerate it, your friends won't tolerate it. You no, know, can't decide what you want to do. And you're like, we're going to this place for dinner. We're going to go at this time and we're doing that. Nobody likes that. But that's kind of what you're trained to act like at work. So you really have to actively not be who you are at work when you're not at work. And the way to do that is to really make a clean divide. Um, you know, it's nice to have those skills, you know, if. Uh, Something emergent happens. I'm usually the I'm usually the one that everybody turns to in the whole neighborhood and community because they know I won't panic and I'll have a plan. But uh, just have to keep an eye on it. Next question about DOs. Yes, there are DOs in our program. We have probably a quarter DOs and three quarter MDs in our residency program. Um, and the DOs are just as well changed as the MDs. Uh, there are some of the DO schools are newer than some of the MD schools, so they haven't developed as much of a reputation. So it can be a little bit harder to get into residency. Uh, but as far as I can tell, the training is the same because when we get a good, we get a good doctor. I usually don't know if they're a DO or an MD. I can't tell the difference, and they're trained really well. So that's a very good question. I, that's something where uh, I think we've overemphasized the distant difference in the past. I give a history of medicine lecture that talks about the difference, but the difference now is pretty small in the training. There are some differences, uh, but the practical reality of the residents we train at, the DOs and the MDs are about the same. Um, next question is really good. How long does it take to get used to medical trauma and to deal with it mentally? This is similar to the stress question, but I'll give a more specific answer. So I hate it when people are in pain. And so when I first started, if somebody was a ton of pain, I would pass out. And you guys ever pass out when you see blood or see, so, like the first time when I was a second year med student, I was in some sort of clinical rotation and I was helping do a bone marrow biopsy on a nine-year-old with cancer. And he was like, ow, oh, ow, oh, this hurts. And I totally passed out, fell, hit my head and cut my head open on the table. Uh, and I'm like, oh, I'm screwed. I'm gonna be the worst doctor ever. I can't even stay conscious while I'm taking care of people. Well, I got used to it and it also drove me. That's the thing that bothered me the most. So all my research now is in pain management. I actually write a textbook on pain management now. It's because I hated pain so much. I'm like, my patients are not gonna be in pain. And that's a complicated thing to do. And it's been my whole career. So now I, I probably spend half my time in a research lab trying to figure out how to get pain better and make sure nobody has any pain or remembers any pain in any way. Um, and uh, so that's turned into my biggest strength. So a lot of times the thing that bugs you the most ends up being what you do. Trauma gets really easy because essentially uh, trauma is super easy to take care of like the first three or four years of your career, it's hard because you have to learn how to move so fast. But once you learn it, you know exactly what's going on. If someone comes in and says, my chest hurts and they look sick, it's really hard because they could be having a heart attack. They could have an aortic dissection. They could have a pulmonary embolism. There's a million things they can have and it's super hard to tell the difference and I have to find out fast or they'll die from it. 
When somebody comes in with a stab wound in their chest, I know exactly what the problem is. They've got a hole in their chest and I just need to figure out what the hole's in and plug up the bleeding. It's easy. Uh, so that part gets really easy. Taking care of people that are injured and sick though is hard. Uh, and it takes a long time to get used to. And that's probably the hardest part for a lot of us. So we've, I've seen some terrible things. I've seen people die of stuff they shouldn't have died from. I've seen people, um, I've had to testify in trials because I, I knew why somebody got killed or how they got killed. Uh, and it's awful stuff to see. Um, and it takes a while to get used to. And what we do is we spend a lot of time talking it out with one another. Uh, we spend a lot of time, most of us have like uh, psychologists that'll meet with us kind of regularly when we see something really bad, especially if it, and as it turns out, the more closely it reflects to a personal experience you've had, the harder it is on you. So we've noticed like new parents always have the hardest time with a child when they, you know, when we take care of a child that dies. Uh, someone who's got a sick parent has the hardest time when an old person dies. And we all feel sympathy for everyone, but when does it make it so you're having trouble finishing your day at work? Uh, we also have a pretty good plan. So when somebody gets something that's overwhelming, we have a good way to get them switched out, get somebody to fill in for them for the rest of their shift. And we just sort of load it. Uh, I wouldn't say you get used to it, but you start learning that it's normal to have a massive grief response, even if it's not someone you knew, uh, because it's like someone you knew or it could have been someone you knew. Um, some people I will say can never go into emergency medicine because they figure out in med school that that's more than they, more than they want to take on. And I think that's just something that, uh, and for some of us, it, for me, it's driven my research. And I grew up in a tough neighborhood and I, I had a lot of friends who were injured from trauma. So I've already personally felt like for me, it drives me because I, I kind of picture some of the people I've known who've been hurt over the years and I'm trying to help them in my mind. Uh, whereas sometimes you see someone helpless who got hurt and it wasn't their fault and nobody tried to help them and it, it becomes overwhelming. So you'd have to kind of acknowledge that there's a range of emotions uh, that we can feel. One thing we don't do is bury it and pretend it never happened though. We have now, we know for sure that that's really bad. So we talk it up, we talk it up a lot. We're not allowed to talk about anything we see specifically outside of work. So it has to be inside work, right? Cause it's everybody's private healthcare information. Um, let's see, I'm gonna keep moving down here. On call, do you ever find yourself on call? I am never on call. Uh, ER docs aren't on call. Um, technically, cause I'm the chair of the department, I'm always on call, but I get called with stuff like uh, Star Trib wants to interview somebody who should they talk to kind of stuff. Not. I, the, I've been called down to the ER for emergencies twice ever, maybe one time. No, when the bridge collapsed, uh, I was at home and I had to come in. Uh, and actually there was a lot of traffic on 394. So the police es escorted me and I followed a police car at like 120 miles an hour. So I got to drive super fast down 394 for my only time ever without getting a ticket. Uh, and then during the riots after George Floyd was, was murdered, I got called in because rioters were trying to break down the doors to the ER. So we need more people here um, to kind of figure out what to do. But no, I'm never on call. Uh, emergency medicine, by the time you could come in from home, whatever they needed you for would be over. So we kind of have to be here in advance. Uh, a lot of my colleagues are on call though. So I work with a lot of, I talk to a lot of people who are on call because really what happened, medicine's changed in the last 30 years. So. A lot of stuff where a doctor would, have, where all the specialists would have stayed in the hospital before the ER doc does. So like one of my best friends is an interventional radiologist and he lives right next door to me, Pratik Seagal. And so a lot of times I call Pratik, I'm like, hey, I'm here and I'm taking care of this guy's chest pain. I just did a CT and I can see he's in aortic dissection. Do you think you can put a graft in this guy? And he looks at the CT from his house and says, yeah, I'll be in half an hour. But he can take a half an hour coming in because I'm there taking care of the guy. But if I was at home, that nobody would be there. So. Lot, there is lots of call in medicine, just not for emergency medicine. Um, gaining patient care experience. Uh, this is a good question. How do you get, because you're supposed to get patient care experience before you go to medical school, right? Or, or PA school. And that's not really easy to do. Uh, well, we had our we have our physician, our, our research assistant associate program at Hennepin. That's been one way to get it for people. Being a medical scribe is another really good way. We also have that happen, and most places have that now. Uh, what's a better experience? Probably being a scribe, but you really have to kind of go all in because it takes a lot of work to learn how to be a scribe. So you kind of have to do it as a full-time job, whereas being a research assistant or research associate, you can kind of be, you know, it's like 10, 15 hour a week kind of a deal. 
being a scribe is good because half of what you learn in medicine is the terminology and our scribes get really good at the terminology. So some of our most experienced scribes, most of them work for us for one or two years where they're applying to med school. The ones that are there for two years, by the end of the second year, don't even really write down what I say because they know what I'm going to say. They just wait for me to say what I think the patient has and they know what to write because they've done so many times, which is a huge advantage going to medical school or PA school to already know that much about patient care. They haven't learned how to make the diagnosis yet. They haven't learned a lot of the exam stuff or the procedures, but they know all that terminology. Uh, so that's a really, a really good experience if you can get it. Um, other ways to get great patient care experience and to find out if you like being around sick people, which isn't for everybody, um, volunteering at, well, nursing homes or hospitals, probably nursing homes better than hospitals though. And I don't say they're both very high quality work and they both are considered important by admissions committees, as far as I know. But I would say uh, being around patients in a nursing home gives you an idea if, if you enjoy talking to people when they're sick, uh, when they're not doing well. Does it make you feel upset and nervous? And it always is a little nerve wracking at first, but is it like a good nerve wracking? Like, I think I can get used to this and this is something I wanna do, or is that I'm always gonna be a little bit grossed out uh, and I'll never get used to this. It's really, one of the reasons they want you to get patient care experience because they want everyone to try to figure it out before because they don't want to have anyone, what happened, what happened to anyone happen what happened to my sister-in-law where you get all the way through your residency before you're like, oh my goodness. She didn't like making life and death decisions. It's hard to be a surgeon if you don't like that. She just, she would keep her awake all night every time she made a decision. After like five years, she realized it wasn't going to go away. And so she went to teaching high school science instead, high school math. Um, you talk about if having the trait of working well under pressure is a necessary trait for my career. Yes, uh, it, it is. It's not in all of medicine. Um, I have some very good friends. Yeah, but you go to med school, you have a lot of friends in every different specialty of medicine. So I have some insight into every specialty, but like I said, only listen to people describing what their own specialty is like, because nobody knows what someone else is like. But um, when I do much better under pressure than I do when I'm not under pressure. So if I'm pretty good at something and you say I'm shooting a basket, if you tell me that you give me 50 bucks if I hit it, I'm 10 times more likely to hit it than if no one's even paying attention to me. That's my, per that's I'm trying to describe a personality trait. That's probably not the best example. Uh, if um, I have to put a tube in somebody's throat and nobody's care, nobody, no, it doesn't really matter. The person's already dead, for example, I might mess it up. If I don't do it perfectly the first time and the person will die, I never miss because uh, I'm focused. Some people, when they feel that pressure, it makes them perform worse. Some people, it makes them feel better. It's hard to know that about yourself until you've been under that kind of pressure. And neither trait is bad. Because uh, a lot of times the person who has trouble under pressure is a much more detail-oriented person. That's the example. So I have a friend who's a hospitalist, and he's the opposite of me. Uh, if nobody's watching, he can always hit the basket. If you tell him you'll give him 50 bucks if he hits it, he's never going to hit it. But when he takes care of a patient, he can look at every single detail and not miss anything. And the chance of me looking at someone and not missing any detail is zero. I always miss details, but I never miss the most important thing. So we're very different people and you need both kind of doctors, right? You need me to shove the tube in your throat because you only have 30 seconds to live and not miss. You need, that, you need him to go through afterwards and figure out all the things that possibly could have gone wrong to see what got you in this situation in the first place. Um, so one isn't better, one isn't worse. But the problem for emergency medicine is that you really have to have that pressure trait where um, being in a situation where if you mess up, something bad happens, makes you do better, not worse. And people can't really figure that out until their third year. And so that's why it's, so I, I say that because a lot of people who say, I want to go to emergency medicine because I want that flexibility. I want those easy, I want those easy hours you know, or the lower amount of hours. I want some control like that. I want to make diagnoses. And then they figure out that that pressure is, is not good for them. It doesn't work. And you need to, the earlier you figure out, the better. Because if you end up in emergency medicine, you don't do under pressure, it, it's a miserable career. If you end up in a detail-oriented career and you realize you're not a detail-oriented person, it's going to be a miserable career, right? I would be the worst hospitalist ever because I'd be running around like, oh, I forgot to check that. Oh, I forgot to do this. Oh, I forgot to order that. 
I'd be awful at it, but I'm really good at emergency medicine. I'm not saying that to be egotistical. I'm just, I'm, it's what I'm built for. I, I'm, I'm always excited to do everything. I don't get, I, I usually don't mess up under pressure and uh, I let go of details easily. So I focus on the important thing. I don't focus on the small stuff that doesn't matter at that second. Um, so you need both. Uh, I, another example I'll give you, because I had a great friend in med school and we were both going to be ER docs. And this is like October of our fourth year. So late, we had to get our applications in in like a week or two, almost out of time. And he was on a second rotation in emergency medicine. And he realized he's a total introvert and he hated meeting new people. Like he could do it, but it made him uncomfortable. And he realized one of the things about emergency medicine is you meet like 40 or 50 new people a day and have a fairly intimate conversation about them, about personal details. And he hated that. He loved everything about the specialty and he was good at it, but he just couldn't picture him spending the rest of his life meeting 40 or 50 new people a day and having very detailed, specific conversations about their personal private information with them. Made him uncomfortable. So he became an anesthesiologist. He's actually, what, well, he's actually the head of anesthesia at a really big academic center now. Because um, those, those patients are unconscious and don't remember the person that takes care of them. But it's very similar to emergency medicine. They do a lot of procedures. The hours are very specific. Uh, he just found a different specialty. Um, where I would be a terrible anesthesiologist, I'd keep trying to make conversation with people. <laughs> I like know, but it was just—he figured out it was the wrong specialty for him. There are a lot of traits that go with your specialty, and you have to, that's why we do rotations in med school, so you can kind of see where you fit, uh, what you're going to be good at. Because there's not anybody who's going to be good at everything in medicine, but there's probably something for everybody. There's a completely different skill sets. Um, my friend Pratik Segal, the interventional radiologist, he spends most of his time not talking to anyone in a dark room looking at pictures for details. I would not be able to stay awake in a dark room looking at a picture for details. He would hate my job because people would keep interrupting him to ask him questions and he'd have to keep running from room to room. I would hate his job because I'd have to look at this MRI with a thousand images and find the one that looked abnormal. Uh, we both love our jobs and we are the opposite. And he's a we're, we're like a, he's, he's very, very quiet introvert and I'm a very, very loud extrovert, uh, which is probably why we're good friends because we cover each other's soft spots or <laughs> we cover each other's weaknesses and uh, why we're such good colleagues at work, but our works, he found a job that fits his personality and I found one that, that fits mine. Um, moving on, how was medical school? Uh, medical school, I can actually, I remember it so vividly because I have a friend who's just, whose kid is just starting med school right now, I was just talking about him. So about two weeks into med school, I realized it felt just like final exams did in college. Uh, the same, it was the amount of work that you did during final exams in college. It just went on for the whole first two years. Um, that's about as close as I come to what, what med school was like. <laughs> so it's just a lot of work. Um, that being said, uh, it's, you're studying something that you practically need. There isn't anything you study in med school that you don't know you'll absolutely need to know for the rest of your career. So you know you're not wasting your time. I will say, I'm glad I went to med school. And I think everyone, most everyone I know who went is glad they went to med school. Nobody would say, boy, I would do that again if I had a chance. Meaning like if you could go again right now. Whereas almost everyone I know, if you said, if somebody said you could take four years right now and do college again, would you do it? Most people would say yes. And this time I'd major in art history or music or something totally different than I do just for fun. People said, would, if you got a chance to go back and do med school again, you do it. And I don't think anybody would say like, yeah, absolutely. I'd do it again. There's only one thing to study. So you wouldn't get to do anything different. It's just, uh, it's hard work. But your life is your, I mean, you can't let four years of your life go, on, go by without doing anything fun. I didn't let a week of my life go by without enjoying myself. Uh, you just have to, it's not, you know, a lot of, like when you're in med school, nobody has a side job. Uh, nobody, you don't have a lot of hobbies. You kind of, your hobbies are like one thing. Like I exercised. I'm a, I'm a skier and a runner. And I skied and run and ran when I was in med school. And that's about what I had time for. Um, I went to med school down in Rochester, Minnesota. I don't know if any of you guys have been there, but I didn't love it there. Uh, so I was up in the cities. I had a bunch of friends, all my friends from high school and college lived up here. So I mean, from, from college who are from Minnesota, we're up here. So I would just drive up here every Friday night and go back Sundays because there's not much to do down there. So I had plenty of, plenty of time to hang out and enjoy his life. It wasn't, it's not that bad. It's just, uh, it's not any harder than finals week. It just, 
it was about, it was probably three or four weeks in where I realized this is just how it was going to be for the whole year. Third and fourth year, relatively easy. Then you're just, you're just going to rotations. The rotations are high pressure and uncomfortable, but you don't, you know, it's uh, really, it's just, uh, it's just clinical work. Um, there's not a, there's a little bit of studying outside of it. There's not a lot of exams. It's not very much pressure. Uh, you're, it's for you to decide what you want to go into more than it is you're being assessed. And you get grades and stuff still first and second year, and they help you get into the residency you want. So you want to do well in them. But by a third year, things start to kind of calm down. Uh, then it's more about you want to learn this so you're good at your job rather than you need, you need to impress your teacher so they give you a good grade, which is a nice feeling. Like you're learning something because you need to know it, not because somebody's going to not say nice things about you unless you do what they want. I liked that about med school better than I liked about college. Um, uh, question. Do you think that people might choose ER because it gives you an outlet to be bossy? That's a really good, because I kind of said you have to learn to be bossy, but um, no, I think you have to learn to be bossy because you only can be bossy in emergencies. So I had to learn to take charge in an emergency because when there's only seconds to save someone's life, it doesn't matter. There's usually five or six things you can do, but someone's got to pick one first. So someone just needs to take over. So part of our training in emergency medicine is to train people to take over situations. But it doesn't come naturally to very many people going into emergency medicine. That part, we have to teach them. Uh, and we have to teach them to make sure they don't use it outside of work because everyone will dislike you for it. Because um, we've seen the negative implications of that. Sometimes you just end up being a, having no friends because you get bossy. But now, most of us, when we go into it, it's more like uh, curious. You're the kind of person that asks too many questions is the personality trait I would see in most DR docs. So you kind of ask people a lot of questions. You're kind of, um, ER docs tend to really like trivia, especially the ones that go into toxicology. It's, the, it's like the running joke among toxicologists. So you go into toxicology because you like knowing things that nobody else needs to know. Uh, Cause they know like you're like, is that plant poisonous? And they can tell you because they know about and they can answer for every plant in the world and every food in the world and everything in your cupboard and they know it all. They're the ultimate in trivia. But most ER docs kind of like knowing a little bit about everything. That's when I go into it. So they tend to be talkative extroverts uh, who talk to people. Um, and we have to train them to be bossy. Uh, there's a, that being said, the average person in medicine is fairly bossy to start with. So it's kind of you have to be willing to tell people what to do. Um, but in my situation, if it's not an emergency, if the patient is still, um, if the patient's awake, or if somebody's unconscious and dying, I don't really talk to them about what I'm doing. I, they're not there. So I just kind of take care of them as fast as I can. But a lot of my time is spent explaining to people what's wrong with them and presenting the options they have and trying to convince them of what I think they should do. So it's, it's and if you get bossy, people would shut down. They're like, I'm not going to do that. This guy's just telling me I have to do this. I don't know if you've seen doctors like that, but nobody wants to do it. The doctor says, you have to do this. People are like, wait a minute, I need a second opinion. So I spent a lot of time saying to people, well, here's what I think's wrong. And here's the options. And you know, here's what I would do. Here's something else you can try and kind of working through it with them so they can pick something that works for them. Um, there's a lot of different situations people are in, right? But it's, it's a really good question though. Um, there are a lot of different personality traits that fit in a lot of different places in medicine now. Uh, so that's a really good question. Maybe I'm giving you a weak answer. <laughs> we do usually, well, though, when we have to teach someone a new personality trait, we have to teach them how to be bossy. They're too nice and they're trying to negotiate. In an emergency, we just have to do something. Someone just has to be in charge. And that, that doesn't come naturally to many people. Um, all right, let, let, the next question I see here is, how has emergency medicine evolved with COVID-19? Also a very good question. It's evolved a lot, because, uh, well, actually, maybe it hasn't. It's been really slow. So at Hennepin, we're busy with COVID. Like on Monday was the last time I was in the ER, I was in the office the rest of the week. I ordered 14 COVID tests and all 14 were positive. So everyone, I'm, I took care of probably 40 people. And 14 had symptoms with COVID and everybody I sent the test on had it positive. That was my first day I was 100% I was positive on the tests I sent, which meant I probably should have sent more tests. 
Uh, but normally I would see 60 people on day, not 40. It's kind of slow. Nobody's drinking, nobody's driving. Um, nobody's going on vacation. So all the things that get people hurt and wind them up in our ER aren't happening. The only thing that we're seeing more of than we would have other than fever and cough is uh, drugs. We're seeing more overdoses. Not more than we saw back in the 90s and early 2000s, but getting back to those numbers. So I'm back to seeing five or six heroin overdoses a day from one or two a year ago. And five or six a day is about what I was seeing in 99, 2002. So drugs are up. Our practice has changed in that we have to wear a mask all the time. We actually have these big like helmets. It kind of looks like, my kids think it looks like a stormtrooper's helmet, except that the front's glass. And it's like a built-in filter and cooling system. And I have that thing on my head a lot because we get coughed on a lot. The masks work fine though. Um, I, you know, I said a lot of us have caught it, uh, but it's it's after being exposed to like 50 people a day with COVID for six months. Uh, like almost, not only one of us got it in the whole month of March and maybe two more in April. And it's kind of been a steady since then. And probably half of us have gotten it, have gotten it from our kids bringing it home. So we haven't all caught it at work. Um, and it's hard to tell sometimes. Uh, so now it's just, you know, we have a, probably a 1,000 chance of catching it every time we take care of somebody with COVID. As long as we're wearing a mask and eye protection and gloves. Uh, but we've all seen 1,000 patients now. So statistically, we're all, we're coming due. And there's still probably a third of us that haven't gotten it yet. Uh, we're supposed to get vaccinated a week from Monday. See if that really happens. I don't know. See if we can make it to a week from Monday without everybody catching it. Nice to vaccinate somebody and have them not have had COVID. Um, we don't know how long the immunity lasts, so we're all excited to get vaccinated anyway, just so we can uh, know at least that we're, because a lot of people caught it, not a lot, but there are, we're getting towards people who are now six months out. We don't even know how long the immunity lasts. Most coronaviruses, it lasts like three to seven months for all the other coronaviruses, so probably it's the same for this one. The vaccine will probably last a little longer because it's kind of specifically stimulating to the immune system, so it'll probably last more like six months to a year, maybe longer, who knows? Uh, we don't know that much about COVID. We're learning as we go. Um, we've done a bunch of research projects. We've had, I, as I said, I've done research on pain my whole career. We switched to COVID research in March and we've done a bunch of different trials and we've got a bunch of different grants to study different drugs and different interventions. So we, our research has picked up but it's all been focused on COVID. Um, other things we've added or taken away, uh, we don't uh, have a waiting room anymore. You, you wait a lot in our year but you could see by a doctor within seconds of arriving. We'd started to add that before COVID, but now we do it 100% because we need to screen out who was high risk and who wasn't. But that works a lot better. That was a big change in our specialty. Uh, Cause then we don't leave anybody who has something that might get worse really quickly. Um, and that change will probably never go away. Uh, for the clinics, they've added tons of telemedicine. We didn't have any before, but we're not finding a real useful place for telemedicine in, uh, in EM, emergency medicine. Cause if it's a big enough emergency, and they're at home on a thing, uh, we still have to get the medics to them and it's just delayed things. So we, the last thing we want is somebody with a heart attack trying to find us online to talk about the heart attack and because we can't do anything remotely yet. Um, I've run out of questions. Did I miss anything? Uh, I think I hit them all. Um. Yeah, I think you did. Thank you so much. I think yeah, you're, yeah. you're the first emergency medicine doctor we've had. So it's been interesting to learn about how COVID has affected the ER the most, I think, out of other specialties. Yeah, um, we take care of a lot of COVID. I mean, it's because the hospital's full, so the people can't leave. So generally, when I'm working, there's 20 or 30 people with COVID in the department. And I diagnose it, well, Monday, 14 times, usually 10 to 14 or 15 times a day, I diagnose it. We've been around a lot of people with COVID. I've, put a, I've intubated a lot of people with COVID. So intubating, you know, they come in and they can't breathe and we put it in a tube for them. So we've uh, seen a lot of people die from COVID too. So that gets frustrating when I see people won't wear a mask and stuff because I've, I've talked to a lot of people who are you know, healthy and not going to die this year short of a car accident or something who are dead three days later after I met them uh, from COVID. It's really random. Someday we'll figure out why some people die from COVID and some people barely even know they're sick, but right now we don't know. So every now and then we'll take care of a 35 year old with nothing wrong with them and they'll die from COVID a few days later. And then the next 99 people that are like that, we see 
just have a runny nose. Uh, but that's why this has been so hard. That's why it's spreading so much, right? Because we haven't been able to get people to believe. If, if the death rate was a lot higher, everybody wear a mask because they'd be worried about their own personal safety, but it's low enough that it's theoretical, the risk. So nobody wears a mask because they will be fine if they catch it. They're not really thinking about, well, if I expose a hundred people to it, I killed somebody. Uh, nobody's, that's maybe too, It's nobody's thinking that far ahead and they're having trouble making that. The, the CDC has had a hard time explaining that in a way that non-medical people understand. That's how I'd explain it. I'd say if you, uh, if you don't wear a mask and you have it and you don't know you have it and you run into a hundred people in grocery stores and malls, you just killed somebody. And then I think most people can sympathize with that, but instead they, they've got it very theoretical terms that nobody really gets, but we regularly have patients when they get COVID saying, I thought this was all made up. <laughs> uh, or there, we've even had patients tell us they thought, they still think we're making it up when we tell them they have COVID and they're dying from it, we've had that. So that's a strange situation. Um. Well, thank you so much for coming. Um, That's my pleasure. Yeah, it was. Um, I th yeah, I think there's no other questions. So thank you guys so much for coming. Thank you, Dr. Biner. We learned a lot. I think, yeah, you're the first emergency medicine physician we've had. So that's been really interesting to learn about. Well, when COVID's over, if any of you are interested, take a look at the research associate program. So it's been a great program for undergraduates at the U uh, to get exposed to medicine, get some patient contact time. Um, and it, it's, it's not much now because of COVID, but by summer, it'll be running again. So uh, it's at hcmcem.com. And if you just look under HCMC Research Associate Program, Emergency Medicine Research, you'll find it. It's pretty easy to find online. But uh, it's a great program. A lot of people have had a really good experience. But like I said, about a third of our doctors did it when they were undergrads at some point or another. So <laughs> awesome. Nice to meet you guys. Thanks so much for your awesome questions. I hope I answered them adequately. I kind of tend to ramble sometimes. Nice to meet everybody. Thank you, Dr. Miner. Thank, okay. you. Thank, you. Oh, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.